Hey Soko family, back again. The laptop is back, so you know what this means. It's time for some serious scholarship. So now, I've heard a lot of people say, prove the Trinity from the Old Testament. Christians invented the Trinity. We've heard, we hear this from you know Jews, we hear this from Muslims. So now I thought to myself, okay, let's provide some scholarship on the concept of the Trinity and how this became into be. So we then have to take a historical approach into looking at information. And this is one thing Christians can do that other people cannot do. So as we see, the topic of today is the word that became flesh. So now in John 1, we see in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Now this word that John uses, i.e. the Logos or the word, seems to be a very peculiar word that we don't really see in the Gospels. So we have to ask ourselves, for John to use this word, this must have been a concept that Jewish people understood. So we then have to look historically at what this could have been referring to. So to understand the Bible, according to VP Long, we need three things. Literary competence. This is the ability to utilize the ancient conventions and workings of the narrative to assess their truth claims because the stories are literary art first and with history flowing out of the stories. So therefore we have the Psalms, the Proverbs, the writings, the historical aspects. So these are all parts and aspects of the Bible. And we have to understand this to understand what the Bible is communicating to us. It's not like the Quran, where it's just theologically making statements for Muhammad to uh, abide by and creeds for Muslims to go forward by. So we see the theological comprehension, which is understanding more than anything that the narratives show how God was behind the historical events, guiding and controlling the action, not only transcendent over his creation, but also imminent in human affairs. And this is why we can have books like the book of Esther, where God is not mentioned once, but we see a coming together of God's divine plan. And they don't mention him, but we see how God works within the universe and all things come together uh, according to God. And then also we have the historical criticism. So as the narrative presents themselves as true historical events, they must be assessed in that way. So a biblical historian should also be open to the possibility, for the possibility of divine action, because this is what the Bible is professing to be. So I'll start off throwing this question to people. In Psalms 33, 6, it says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. So my question to you is, is this figuratively speaking or is this speaking about the real presence? And we'll kind of come back later on to look at this. But I want people to kind of make their assumptions, uh, make a decision whether you think it's metaphorical or a real presence. And maybe some people's opinions will change, some maybe it won't. But we'll go on and we'll see and present the information. So the Bible is one grand integrative narrative and that's what's unique about the Bible. It's over 2,000 years of writings that come to a conclusion. So as St. Augustine once said, the New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament and the Old Testament is revealed in the New. So to, again, to understand the Bible, we need to understand the principle of accommodation. This is the theological principle that God uses language that accommodates our human understanding of things. For example, God spoke about himself in ways that sometimes personify, personify him in a human way. If God says he regrets something or God says, you know, it pleased him, God doesn't share the same uh, emotions as us in a way, but he communicates in a way that we can understand. So this all begins now, our historical uh, journey from the two powers in heaven. And now 25 years ago, rabbinical scholar Alan Siegel produce what is still a major work on the idea of two powers in heaven in Jewish thought. Siegel argued 
that the two powers idea was not deemed heretical in Jewish theology until the second century CE. He carefully traced the roots of these teachings back into the Second Temple era. Siegel was able to establish that the ideas and antecedents were in the Hebrew Bible, specifically passages like Daniel 7, 9, Exodus 23, Exodus 15, 3. However, he was unable to discern any coherent religious framework from which these passages and others were consequent, conceptually derived. So here he's trying to say that these ideas are in the Old Testament, but he cannot find anything that they have been drawn from. So he says Persian dualism was unacceptable as an explanation since neither the two powers in heaven were evil. Siegel speculated that the divine warrior imagery of the broader ancient Near East likely had some relationship. So we go on and we see in Genesis about when God appeared to Abraham. It says, then the Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre in the heat of the day while he was sitting up at the entrance of his tent. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he ran from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And then we see that the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. So clearly we see in Genesis 19.1 that the two angels that came to Sodom and Gomorrah in that evening and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. So we see the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah but the Lord went elsewhere. But then when we get to Genesis 19.24 it says then the Lord and I'll use the anglicized word of Jehovah rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah sulphur and fire from the Jehovah out of heaven. So clearly we see Jehovah in two locations. And then we jump to Amos 4.11 where it says, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning. Yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. So this is in correlation to Genesis 19.24. And what's surprising is that we see God saying he has a God. So when Muslims say, oh, but Jesus prayed to God, how can God have a God? We clearly see God referring to another distinct person who is calling God, or here is Elohim. Elohim can be used as a title of respect. How would this get into the Old Testament? Seems very odd. So now, we have clearly in the Ten Commandments, you shall not have any other gods before me. So God is obviously clearly, clearly telling the Israelites that they should not worship anything other than him. So then we have to ask ourselves, why was the Shema revealed? Because it says here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, is God just repeating himself? Or does God know that when he gave Moses the Torah, Moses wrote about two Jehovah's? And people might get confused thinking, hold on, in the Ten Commandments it says, you shall have no other God before me. But then we're seeing two Jehovah's. So is God saying that these two Jehovah's that you're seeing are one? To stop the confusion so people do not go fall into polytheism. So this is where it all begins, the concept of God being one. And the word used here is ahad. And we clearly see the word ahad can mean a, uh, a unit of one or a compound one, not a singular one, which some people try and say. So now we're going to go and start looking at the historical text. We have the Targum and it says the Targum were originally spoken translation of Jewish scriptures that the Megaturman would give to in the common language to the listeners that was not Hebrew. So this is a text that was in Aramaic and because in the first century Jewish people did not speak Hebrew so they had to then translate it into uh, Aramaic or it was an Aramaic uh, kind of paraphrasing of the Hebrew Bible and we see Jews will say this is accepted within Judaism and it goes back to the prophets and the people who wrote it like Jonathan Ben Uzel were inspired people, inspired sages. So now what we see that's interested in here is that concept of the memory of the Lord and it says, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia, the word in the sense of the creative or directive word or speech of God manifesting his power in the world of matter or mind. A term used especially in the Targum as a substitute for the Lord when an anthropomorphic expression is to be avoided. So it says, in the Targum, the Memra figures constantly as the manifestation of the divine power or as God's messenger in place of God himself. 
whenever the predicative is not in conformity with the dignity of the spirit of the deity and it says like the Shekinah the manifestation of God near to God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel now the problem we have is this is within the Jewish encyclopedia and it says the Memra sits on God's throne and receives prayers now this would be what Muslims call sh shirk or polytheism because how can something other than God sit on his throne and receive prayers but this is clearly where we start seeing why John was using the saying uh, Jesus was the word because the Memra was something seen in traditional Judaism as something that sat on God's throne and received prayers and we'll look at some of the verses and how they translate it so we see in the Targum Neophyte and it says from the beginning with wisdom the Memra of the Lord created and perfected the heavens and the earth so clearly we're seeing they're stating it was the Memra that created the world not even God himself now we go on to the Bible this is the Hebrew Bible it says so God created man in his own image and in the image of God he created him male and female he created them but obviously as Christians we will say this can kind of include the attributes of being able to love to express emotions to reason but is there an, another meaning to this? Because when we go into the Targum, it says, and the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. So the original Jews were saying that the word had a physical uh, embodiment and that we were not necessarily created, that the word did not have the appearance of the humans, but the humans had the embodiment of the word of the Lord when it was divinely manifested. This is how they're interpreting it. We go on and it says in Genesis 17 7 I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed and after thee in their covenant generations for everlasting covenant so God is here making a covenant with Abraham but when we go into the Targum it says and I have established my covenant between my word and thee so God is saying the covenant was between the words and Abraham that's very interesting because we go on and when it we go on to Genesis 19 24 it says then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah for sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven but when we go on to the Targum it says and the word of the Lord himself had made to descend upon the people of Sodom and Amorah showers of favour that they might work repentance from the wicked works but when they saw the showers of favour they said so our wicked works are not manifest before him he turned then and caused to descend upon the bitter men and fire from before the Lord from the heavens so clearly in early Judaic thinking we see a distinction that they're saying the word and there was the Lord two differences right this isn't Christian uh, you know writing this is from accepted classical Judaic writings then we go again to Exodus it says because the Lord kept the Virgil that night to bring them out of Egypt this same night is to be a virgin to the Lord to be observed by all the Israelites for the generations to come so now when we go into the Targum again it says it is a night to be observed and celebrated for the liberation from before the Lord in bringing forth the sons of Israel made free from the land of Mizraim four nights are there written in the book of memorial night first when the word of the Lord was revealed upon the world it was as it was created and then it goes on to night two when it says when the word of the Lord was revealed unto Abraham but clearly they're using this term of the memoir was the one that was manifesting in creation and then we go again to Exodus 3.14 where God sees, a, uh, God sees Moses and he tells him his divine name and he says this will be my name forever but when we go into the Targum, it says, And the word of the Lord said to Moshe, He who spake to the world be and it was, and who will speak to it be and it will be. And he said, Thus shalt thou speak to the sons of Israel, Aya has said me unto you. The cleaning now in the early Jewish thinking, they're saying the word of the Lord was the one that spoke to Moses. And it says be and it was. And then we see in Genesis, we see God said, Let there be light and other things. God is creating by the use of the word be. But funny, when we go to the Quran, 2.117, it says, Originator of the heavens and the earth, when he decrees a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. Now, why is Allah copying from the word of the Lord? Because the word of the Lord says, be, and it is. But we never see in the Quran, ever, 
LSAB and something is created. So clearly we know this has been plagiarised because it would be very weird that Alice is B and it is and Muslims keep saying Alice says that but we never see the word B and it is used in the Quran but yet we see the word B and it is in the Bible. So now this is again from the Jewish Encyclopedia and this is devastating because it says like the Shekinah again the memory is accordingly the manifestation of God the memory brings Israel near to God and sits on his throne receiving the prayers of Israel but then they say so in the future shall the memory be the comforter my Shekinah I put amongst you my memory shall be unto you a redeeming deity how could it be a redeeming deity then it says, and you shall be unto my name a holy people. My memory shall be unto you like a good plowman who takes off the yoke from the shoulders of the oxen. But wasn't it Jesus who came to take the sins of mankind? And then it says the memory will roar to gather the exiled. But I thought Jesus said he came for the lost sheep of Israel. They were the exiled. And then it says, the memory is the witness. Jesus was the witness to the father. It will be to Israel like a father, like the Bible says we will be adopted into the sonship. And it, then they say, and will rejoice over them to do good. And then they say in their memory, the redemption will be found. But Christians say in Jesus, the redemption will be found. And then it says the holy word was the subject of the hymns of Job. So how can something other from God do all these things? because these are the things Christians claim Jesus did but did we somehow insert this into the Old Testament because this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia so how are they getting this from their own scriptures if we invented the Trinity and this concept of Jesus being God we continue now I asked you earlier on when it says the word of the Lord is it a metaphor or a real present so we go to Jeremiah 1 4 to 9 and it says, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord, God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid for, of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And then it says, Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So if this was figuratively speaking, how did the word reach out its hand and touch his mouth? So now we have to ask ourselves, when it uses the word of the Lord within the Old Testament, is it referring metaphorically or is it a real presence? Because clearly here, you see that word had the real presence. Now, when we look in the Bible, there are many prophecies towards Christ. And Christians accept all of them. But Jews do not accept all of them. Because if you have a road map to somewhere and you do not follow the signs, you get lost. But this is why Christians follow all the road signs and they all lead to the Messiah. Now, we're going to look at some very interesting things in the Bible. So to understand the Bible, you need to understand it's literary. So you have similes, which are resemblance, and people can look at these re references. So you have allegories, which is comparisons by representation. Metaphors, again, which are representations. Hypocatastasis, which has an implied resemblance or representation. A type, which is a figure, or an example of something future, or an analogy, a resemblance of particulars between things otherwise unlike. So now, here is the first biblical foreshadowing of Christ. In, Numbers in the book of Numbers, God instructs the Israelites to form a formation. He gives them the exact instructions and we see the exact numbers of the people. But clearly what we here see here is a cross. Is this a coincidence? Why would God give them specifics and somehow we see it forms a cross? And in the centre was the presence of God and around it was the the, the, the priests, the Levitical priests. So why does this mirror the cross when Jesus was on it? Because on that cross was God and he was the new high priest. But some people might say, well, you're reading into this. So we'll continue and look into this because the, type of, the foreshadowing is all linked together. 
Now, we know this is true because God says, I declare the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things which have not been done saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish my good pleasure. So God has always put things in the Old Testament to be revealed later on. So we know that this is from God. This is why we have prophets because they prophesy about things that happen and people know when it happens, it's from God. Because God also says, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing but the honour of kings is to search out a matter. And he also says, listen, O my people, to my instructions. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter the things hidden from old. So God is clearly telling us how he is encrypting the Bible, things to be revealed later on. Because in Isaiah 28, 9 to 10, we see some of the people, again, were a bit unhappy about this, and they say, who does the Lord think we are? They ask, why does he speak to us like this? So they're speaking to the prophet and he says, are we little children just recent, recently weaned? And the prophet is saying, for precept upon, must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So what is being said is that prophecies and sayings are revealed piecemeal bit by bit and the people didn't like it because it's been revealed quite gradually and quite slowly but this is why to understand the scripture we use this principle of precept upon precept because the Bible builds towards something greater and this is why we look at the prophecies and know where it leads to and this is why for example Jesus said you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me now, everything about Jesus was in the Old Testament and we see even Paul who Muslims say invented Christianity what did he say he said the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea and when they arrived they went into the Jewish synagogue now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica they received the word with all eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so when Christians are challenged about Jesus's divinity we do not need to rely on the New Testament because as Apostle Paul did, he clearly established that these things can be proven from the Old Testament. So therefore we should have a good grasp of the Old Testament because the Old Testament tells us who Jesus was going to be and when he was coming. Now, this is why we see in John that it says, Philip and Nathaniel said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So when Muslims say Muhammad is in Deuteronomy 1818, no. We clearly see they found it was Jesus who was being spoken about. Jesus affirmed the same thing. Now, we see Jesus was a wise and wonderful teacher. It's, and he said, at the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them all the scriptures, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. This is our precedent. So, but when we see Muhammad, it says in the Quran 10, 4, 94, so if you endow, O Muhammad, about which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading scripture before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, so he never be amongst the doubters. So we have to ask, why is it Jesus was able to show himself from the scriptures, but Muhammad had to go and ask the people of the book? Why couldn't he show the people and say, hey guys, I'm in the Truman 1818. I am in all these other books. He couldn't. But Allah gave him wisdom. So how come he wasn't able to do what Jesus could do? You see? So, and the funny thing is, is when we go into the Hadith, it says, Allah's messenger said, the roof of my house was opened whilst I was at Mecca on the night of the mirage and Jibril descended. He opened up my chest and washed it with the water of Zamzam. Then he brought the golden tray full of wisdom and belief and poured it in my chest and closed it. So we're clearly seeing that Muhammad apparently had wisdom and belief. So where was the wisdom to teach the people of the scripture where he was inside it? And the second thing is, how on earth is wisdom and belief physical? How do you open someone's chest to give them wisdom and belief? Clearly this does not make sense. So anyone praying for wisdom and belief may get a visitation and their chest is opened and it's poured out within them. This does not make sense because I always thought an angel was heavenly beings, you know, quite grand, 
wings and quite, you know, handsome people. But according to the uh, hadith, I've changed my opinion. Because clearly, according to Islamic tradition, angels look like this. And this is uh, Dr. Jibreel with his golden dish of wisdom and belief. Because clearly, uh, angels must be some sort of doctors that they open you apart and then insert wisdom and belief into you. I just find this astonishing. And then we start with the first prophecy to establish a timeline of when the Messiah is to come. And it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people. So now when we go into the Jewish rabbinical view, they say this refers to King Messiah, whom the kingdom belongs. So did Onkelos render it until Messiah comes who the kingdom belongs. So we have a timeline of when the Messiah is starting to supposed to come by. And again, we go into the Talmud, it says Shiloh is understood as a reference to the Messiah. And again, Rabbi Sheila said Shiloh is his name as it started. Now, what is very interesting, as I've said about God and his foreshadowing and how he interweaves his narrative into the Bible, we go and look at what Shiloh is. Now, we see Shiloh was a city in ancient Israel, situated north of Bethel and south of Sashem in the hill country of Ephraim. During the period of Judges, it was a major religious center and a permanent site of the sacred tabernacle, which the Israel Israelites carried through the wilderness. So we saw the cross being carried through the wilderness to where? To Shiloh. And Shiloh is a center of religious worship. But then the prophecy is saying Shiloh is going to come. So Shiloh must be someone who is the center of religious worship. Because it says the Bible describes Shiloh as an assembly place for the people of Israel from the time of Joshua. Sacrifices were brought there by the Israelites during the period of the Judges and was also the site of various religious celebrations and festivals, just as Jesus is. And then it says Shiloh declined in importance after this, especially after the establishment of the Temple of Jerusalem. So we have Shiloh was a religious place, center of worship. It started to decline and then the Temple of Jerusalem took over. But then finally, finally, when Shiloh came, what happened? The Temple was destroyed. So this was the new focus of the religious worship. That was Jesus. And this is why it says Shiloh. God used the, that word for a reason. That's why they, the Jews even say Shiloh refers to the Messiah. Because Jesus is now the centre of worship. And this is how Bible links things together and this is why God says we search out these things within the scripture we see the cross come to Shiloh and then Shiloh was put on the cross for our salvation and then we see again it says after the death of Herod the Great Archelaus had been placed over Jewish uh, over Judea as the ethnarch by Caesar Augustus broadly rejected he was removed in 6 a 77 AD he was replaced by a Roman pro procurator named Caponius. Then it says the legal power of the Sanhedrin was immediately restricted and the adjudication of capital cases was lost. So clearly we see the first fulfillment of Genesis 49.10. The scepter had departed. The rulership had been taken away from the Sanhedrin. And then we go to the next prophecy. It says, but thou Bethlehem, Ephratah, Thou shalt be, shall be little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of ye shall come forth from me, that is to be a ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. But clearly this verse is talking about where the Messiah will be born. And as we can see on this map, there are two Bethlehems. But this one correctly guesses which one he will be born in. And this is how people were able to identify Jesus was the Messiah. These are the prophecies he had to fulfill. And then we see again in Matthew, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, confirmation. And then it says another prophecy in Isaiah. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now Emmanuel, if we look at Matthew 28, I think 20, Jesus says, I will be with you after he departs. But Jews will say the word here is Alma. 
uh, and that it means a young maiden. But when we go into the Septuagint, for example, it uses the Greek word for virgin, and this is what Matthew uses. So it's the word uh, parthenos. So clearly, the understanding from Jews, because Jews were the ones who translated the Septuagint, they understood this within the Near Eastern culture to always mean a virgin. So when modern day Jews now say, oh, it doesn't mean this, they're lying because the Jews were the ones who translated the Septuagint. And this is what people like Rabbi Singer try and say, and say Jews, Christians invented the concept of a virgin birth from paganism. But if Christians took that from paganism, therefore, uh, Allah took this concept from paganism too. Perfect. So you have a catch-22. Who do you want to listen to? So then clearly we see on one of the videos a, a Muslim caught on to this. And he says, Dear Rabbi, I am trying my best to understand the Jewish version about not believing in Isa, peace be upon him, as a messenger or messiah. Whatever you are telling happened after 325. I 100% agree with whatever you said about the Council of Nicaea, but Isa, peace be upon him, was alive. He never claimed himself to be God or God of, Son of God or any holy or unholy spirit. Even he never dismissed the teachings of Torah and Moses. In fact, he confirmed them, but Jews never believed in peace, Isa, peace be upon him, as Nabi. Why? <laughs> and then he says, at the time there was no council of Nicaea. Nobody called him as son of God. Injil was not in written form. Isa, peace be upon him, preached the same Torah. Isa was mentioned in the Torah as a messenger. But Jews were against him and wanted to kill him. Why? And they killed him according to Christians. Can you help me or will you not answer as usual? Now this is what I'm saying. The catch-22 is either you believe the Jewish interpretation and you have to reject the Quran that Jesus isn't the Messiah or you have to accept the Christian interpretation that the prophecies allude to Jesus as the Messiah but the problem is when you do that the uh, prophecies actually say Jesus was more than a man but let's see what the rabbi says because when I was watching reading that my, that was my initial reaction I felt sorry for that Muslim guy I was in shock but then when the rabbi talks he destroys Islam without actually realising it because he says, thank you for your question. Let's unpack this. As you correctly point out, the Jesus of Christianity and Isa of Islam are completely different. The Jewish people have no tradition about Isa of Islam. So how on earth did the Jewish people have no tradition of Isa? Because I keep telling them, Isa is not a name that anyone knows. When I keep asking Muslims, who is Isa? They think I'm joking. But Rabbi, singer, the Muslim's favourite rabbi has just confirmed the Jews have no tradition of Isa. They understand who Yeshua was, but they do not know who Isa is. So this destroys the Islamic argument. Then he says in Islam, Jesus was a result. Can I ask in sincerity, what was his Sharia? So clearly, Todavia Singer, who the Muslims love, has no clue as who Isa was. But yet he knows who Yeshua was. You see? So then, we know who Jesus was because we see in Isaiah it says there shall come forth from a shoot from the stump of Jesse a branch from his roots shall bear fruit and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him and the spirit of wisdom understanding and the spirit of counsel and might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord so we clearly see Trinitarian aspects because it says the Lord and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him so this is not a Unitarian God but then Jews say in Isaiah is not about the Messiah but we see in Isaiah 9 from Jonathan Ben Uzel who's one of their most respected sages he says the prophet said and this is from the Targum he says the prophet said to the house of David for unto a child is born and unto us a son is given he shall he has taken upon himself the law to keep it his name is called from eternity wonderful the mighty God you live with the end. What does he say? The Messiah. So when any Jew says this verse is not about the Messiah, we can clearly go into their earliest classical texts and they say it's about the Messiah. And we go into Isaiah 53 because Jews say this is about Israel. But clearly in verse 11 it says, And it was the pleasure of the Lord to refine and to purify the remnant of his people. 
in order to cleanse, cleanse their soul from sin, that they might see the kingdom of their Messiah. So again, when they try and say that Christians say this is about Jesus and the Messiah, clearly their classical sources go against them because clearly it says it's about the Messiah. So we need to question them. If you say it's about Israel, how come one of your greatest sages says it was about the Messiah also? And then we go into uh, Isaiah 42 where Muslims love to say it's about Muhammad. But it says, behold my servant, the Messiah. Again, Islam is busted <laughs> because clearly we see from the classical Jewish texts that they believe this verse was about the Messiah. So in the words of Maury Povich, we will say to the Muslims, Muhammad is not the prophet. <laughs> so don't cry about it, but clearly we see, I'm using a historical perspective, going back to the earliest beliefs, Christians never invented this. So now we go as well, that's in line with the prophecies. We have a timeline of when the Messiah has to come by, because it says, behold, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in which whom you delight behold he is come and saith the Lord of hosts so now what we clearly see is that the Messiah is coming with a covenant but when we look in Luke 22 20 it says likewise he also took the cup for after supper saying this cup is my new covenant in my blood which is shed for you so remember the Messiah had to come and visit the temple but it says the Romans destroyed the temple of Jerusalem in 70 AD in the year 10 in 66 the Jews of Judea rebelled against the Roman masters in a response the Emperor was dispatched under the army so clearly we see the first prophecy says that the Messiah has to come before this destruction of the temple but the temple was destroyed oh, no. so therefore we have a beginning of when the messiah is supposed to come and an ending and jesus was the only one who corresponded with it so this is why we have to accept him as the messiah but then when we go for example into islamic tradition we see the quran talks about muhammad visiting the furthest mosque and we go to ibn Sa'id, said who's in his kitab al tabakat however you see it and he says i stood at Al Hijra, shall start from the beginning. It says, I said to him, and this is his, I think, cousin, do not relate this to the people because they will not bel belie you and harm you. He said, By Allah, I shall relate to them things like this. The apostle of Allah, may Allah bless him, said to Gabriel, Oh Gabriel, my people will not confirm it. He said, Abu Bakr will testify to it, and he is a Al Sadiq. The narrator added, Many people who had embraced Islam and offered praise went astray. Then the prophet said, I stood at Al Hijr, Hij, visualized Bayt al Maqdas, and described its signs. Some of them said, How many doors are there in that mosque? I had not counted them, so I began to look and counted it, and counted them one by one, and gave them information concerning them. And Ibn Said said it referred to a vision of the eye which he saw with the eye. So they're saying he saw the temple. But how can Muhammad visit a temple that does not exist anymore and he's counting the doors for the people? So this clearly does, goes against history because there's something very wrong with this. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD and Muhammad said he visited it and when the people asked him about it, he said he counted the doors. But what doors was he counting? So clearly, when Muhammad says anything, I read it with a face like this because anything he says historically doesn't add up. So now, in 1953, Professor of Mathematics Peter Stoner calculated the fulfillment of eight prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus. And they were that he will be born in Bethlehem, that he will be oppressed and he will be afflicted, afflicted, yet he will not open his mouth, that the Messiah would be of the lineage of King David, that the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, that the Messiah would appear riding on a donkey, that, the, that a messenger would be sent to herald the Messiah, which was John the Baptist, and people would cast lots for the Messiah's clothing, and that the Messiah would have his hands and feet pierced. Now, what he said is that the fulfillment of this prophecy, of these prophecies, were calculated to be one in 10 to the 21st power. So that's why in 
one with 21 zeros on the end. And the American Scientific Association reviewed his work and stated that the mathematical analysis based upon the principles of probability, which are thoroughly sound, they said Professor Stoner has applied these principles in a proper and convincing manner. And then we see that there are nearly 300 references to 61 specific prophecies regarding the Messiah, which Jesus fulfilled. And mathematician Lee Strober said that the impossible odds are to be one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. So therefore, no one else could be the Messiah who fulfilled all these prophecies. So that's why when Jesus, Christians say Jesus was the Messiah, there's only one person who fulfilled all these things. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why don't Jews then believe Jesus was the Messiah? But we know that generations of later rabbis had two choices, to either confess the great sin of their first century elders or engage in a cover-up of the biblical historical evidence. So Maimonides, for example, who's a 12th century scholar who Jews uh, follow, he said, warn the Jews of his generation and said to them, do not, be, do not obsess on prophecies and the times of the Messiah to quell interest in prophetic ma matters he refocused and redefined what it meant to be Jewish. So he said, a person should not occupy himself with these and similar things. He said, nor should they, he consider them as essentials, for the study of them will bring you no fear or love. Similarly, no one should try to determine the appointed time of the Messiah's coming. Rather, he should await and believe in the general conception of the matter. So the Jews are saying they know that there was a time frame for the Messiah, and even though it's past, that they should just now await and believe in the general conception that he will come at a certain time. So now to add further admonition, admonition he quoted the Babylon, Babylonian Talmud and where it says all the predestined dates for redemption have passed and the matter of and the matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. But in and we have another problem within Judaism because we have the son of man problem. And it says in Daniel 7, 13 to 14, it says, I kept looking at the night vision and behold, and it says, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the son of man was coming. And it says, he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory and the kingdom that all the peoples, nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is everlasting is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. So now what we see, this is a simile because it says one like the son of man. So a simile is one thing with another thing of a different kind. So therefore, if Jesus called himself the son of man, we know this son of man was a simile. So therefore this person that comes cannot be a human. Because we look at Daniel Boyerin, for example, he's a historian and he says in his book, the two thrones the Theophany of Daniel 7 was no doubt disturbing to at least some Jews at antiquity. We know that other Jews adopted wholeheartedly or simply inherited doubleness of Israel's God, the old ancient of days and the young appearing rider on clouds. Now in their Eastern term, um, so culture, a rider of the clouds was only something you associated with God. So it's like if I said to you next week you'll see me shooting thunderbolts from the sky, you'll think oh who do I think I am, Zeus or something? But this was a clear uh, thing that early Jews understood. The cloud rider was something early associated with God. Then he says in his book, there are two, thus two legacies left to us by Daniel 7. It is the ultimate source of the Son of Man terminology of, for a heavenly redeemer figure. And it's also the best evidence we have for a continuation of a very ancient Bibleian Israelite theology deep into the second temple period. So then we see in modern Judaism, they try and cover up this fact. As Peter Heyman notes from the book of Daniel, nearly on every variety of Judaism maintained the pattern of the Supreme God and his vice regent or visor. Hardly any variant of Judaism seemed to have been able to manage with just one divine entity. So then we see also the Qumran scholars such as Wise and Tabor, the Jewish priests using the book of Daniel 70 week prophecy and the book of Jubilees, calculated that the time window of the Messiah's arrival would be between 10 BC and 2 CE and this is when Jesus arrived between his time frame yeah and we see as well for, for example we see Rabbi Akiva identified that the man in Daniel 7 
as the Messiah. But Akiva's opinion was rejected as blasphemy because it could lead to heresy. That was a belief in Yeshua. And obviously we see rabbis talk about the Lord in uh, Psalms 110 yeah. was the Messiah. You do or not? And then we see in the time, huh? in time, the response to Jewish followers of Yeshua. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Let me just go through this. So, of, did you say the Book of Jubilees? Yeah, they. It was a ap apocryphal which they used. Who used? Uh, the uh, Essenes. So what's your nose? Why do you keep rubbing your nose every time you speak to me? No, it's my my nose run. But let me just continue with this. So it said in in time, in response to Jew, the in response to Jewish followers of Yeshua and the Catholic Church, Orthodox Judaism rejected the idea of a heavenly or divine Messiah. He was merely a human. And God himself, according to Maimonides, was solitary in heaven. No one beside him shall share his throne. But I'm now I'll go to the Jewish encyclopedia and this is what they say. In Daniel 7.13, the passage in which it occurs in the biblical Aramaic, it certainly connotes a human being. Many see a messianic significance in this verse, but in all probability, the reference is to an angel with a an human appearance, perhaps Michael. Now, this is from Jewish encyclopedia. They're saying the son of man is an angel, but Jesus claimed to be the son of man. So this is not something Christians invented. How can the earliest Jews say this prophecy refers to an angel coming down to earth? But Jesus called himself the son of man. And this Jesus was clearly they're the same person. Are you so, sure? so clearly, we're seeing that there was a problem in early Judaism because they associated this other person as sitting on the throne next to God and having the same attributes. So let's say for argument's sake, let's say Jesus wasn't God. How is it the earliest, earliest Jews, the Son of Man was an angel? And they're saying it in the Jewish encyclopedia, but Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man. This is not something Christians invented. So then, we see it as well in, in uh, let me just finish this. Let me just finish this. Let me just finish this, please. I think it's gonna be a reshoot. No, no, no. We'll just edit it. It's cool. It's too long. So then we go into the book of Mark, and it says, in his trial, the high priest stood up. Fucking right in the pussy. <laughs> So again, we go to the trial and it says the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? So clearly Jesus is saying he's that son of man, the cloud rider, which Jews knew in early Judaism was a divine being. A cloud rider was only associated with God. And this is why they charge him, they charge him with blasphemy. But then we go to Mark. Guys, man, allow. No, no, no. Let me, let me, let me finish my thing, <laughs> and then if you, if you wanna, if you wanna interject, uh, fair enough. But let me do. You you may, let me lose a point. I'm lose a point. Let me do. I'm like shocked. Let, like, yeah, but listen, oh, please, listen, cooler, listen. We need to have a conversation. Talmud. Talmud. Bro, really? He quoted from the Talmud. Oh, we did go up from the Rabbi. Oh my God! <laughs> you see, it's people don't want to learn. No, I'm, I'm there, but, bro, is it, but you, you like, let me let me just finish the thing, <laughs> and then we'll continue. Tear and eye. That's wrong. Tear and eye. Hello, hello, go, man. Yeah, but sorry, sorry, God. Because we're I'm trying to I'm trying to educate you lot about who the Messiah was, right? Cool, cool, cool. So we need to understand why did the Jews believe Jesus was the Messiah. So we're going to the earliest sources Messiah, to understand What's the Messiah? Messiah, the Messiah, right? The, the, the Messiah. The Greek word, no, yeah. I'm saying the Messiah. It's a Greek word. The Hebrew Meshach. word. Greek What's word. the Hebrew word? No, Meshach. No, it's okay. The Messiah. It's the Messiah. Right. Oh, no, it's the no, Greek word. Meshach. The Messiah. Meshach. What's Hebrew? The Messiah. What's Hebrew? Ha, Messiah. All right. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let's just continue anyway. So ha. when Jesus hmm? came, he clearly spoke Meshach. in parables, and he said, for example, in Mark 4 to 11, 13, he said. The mystery of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to these on the outside, everything is in, expressed in parables, for they, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? So Jesus is clearly saying when he speaks, 
people aren't going to understand what he's saying, but he's being very clear. This is why, for example, in John 6, 1 to 6, 41, Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He says it again, I have come down from heaven. In John 3, 14, he says, no one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of man. We saw in Daniel, the son of man came down from heaven. People understood this. We see in Luke 10, 8, 10, 18, he says, I saw Satan fall from Amen. heaven like Let's lightning how would jesus see this if he was just an ordinary man he's clearly telling the people but he's also using parables but so people would not ordinary. understand it you're saying it ain't ordinary i'm not saying he's ordinary so then but we you again are saying it ain't ordinary he ain't ordinary no, uh, you are saying it are you ordinary he ain't ordinary no you are saying it are you ordinary who's ordinary you are saying it he ain't ordinary no i'm not you you are saying it. i'm not saying he's ordinary no. Are you ordinary? I'm, I'm ordinary, yes. But you are saying it and you're ordinary, so what's, what's the difference? Okay, <laughs> now we'll continue. So, so in John in John, in John, in John, John 8, 57, the Jews said to him, Are you not 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said, Truly I tell you, Jesus declared before Abraham was, I am. What was he talking about? So we go to Exodus, where, where the divine name was revealed to Moses. Bantu migration, not Exodus. So, we see clearly here, um, Moses spoke with the Lord and he said, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people, I Mawari. am has sent me. So this is what Jesus, Jesus was referring to. Right. Now, Muslims, for example, is say... Is that God's name? Now he says, what, what's good, God's name? Because is Muslims, God's name? I am. Muslims will say Allah. No, no, I'm, I'm asking, it's God's name, I am. Yahuwah is his name. Now, right. so, so, so what but was let me finish. To, to, now, Muslims will say Allah is the name of God that was revealed. But God said to Moses, if anyone comes with a God of another name, do not accept them for your worship, right? Ooh. Now, I'm going to show you something very interesting True because the, the Bible is based True on facts. Bible, yeah. so if the God's the Bible, name is the, not I am, the, the Bible, it's fake. The Bible, now, is that what you're because saying? Because Judaism, or Israelites, sorry, I should say, were linked to the Torah. Now, we look at, let's look at the prophet's names. Because we know, we know El is, the, is, is for God. So we look at the name Ariel, it means Lion of God. Elijah means God is my Yahuwah, your Yehovah. We see Jonathan means Yehovah is gracious. So it doesn't say Allah. Because the name are being put into the names of the prophets. We're clearly seeing God has established his name. And we're seeing the names in all the biblical prophets. Look at all the names. We're seeing the name Yahweh used. Matthew means the gift of Yahweh. So how then can a Muslim say Allah is the only revealed name from God? Because clearly we're seeing that God in, no. or the Israelites incorporated the divine name within the name attributes. of people. They're not talking about the name, they're saying there's only one God but Allah. Yeah. But I've... But they say there's one God no, only. because I've, I've got a, a, fa a, a fatwa yeah. from Islamic scholars that say, because someone asked them the question, is God's name Allah or Yahweh? And they said Allah is the only name that has been revealed the Israelites but we're seeing his name within all their names how would this be possible if the name Allah was revealed so what do the Jews call God because I know something else, they, something they use the name Hashem, Hashem because they don't use the divine name anymore because they say it means so that what they're was the divine using them before, before they used Yahweh. Yahweh but they don't say that anymore we can clearly see but let me go on with the presentation so when we're looking at Jesus they understood what he was saying because the Jews said to him, it is not for good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you being a man, make yourself God. They clearly knew what Jesus was trying to say. And this is why Jesus would say, he did not speak to them without a parable, but privately he explained everything to his disciples. Because he knew the heart of the Pharisees and what they wanted to do with him. So he used his intellect to use words that could kind of get them off his case. And this is why people will say, well, did Jesus claim he was God? Well, let's look what Jesus says. If we go to Matthew 10, 11, 10, and he's talking about John the Baptist. It says, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Behold, these who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. I tell you more than a prophet. This is... He of whom it is written, 
Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare the way before you. So Jesus is using precepts, as we know precept upon precept. So therefore we have to go to the Old Testament to see what he's talking about, because John is that messenger. Now when we go to Isaiah 43, it says, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord, and that's Yahweh. So it's saying that it's going to be a messenger who comes to prepare the way for God. If God was Jesus wasn't saying he was God, why was he referring him back to this precept? Because we see in Malachi 3 1, it says, Behold, I sent a messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord Ha'adon is a title only used for God. It says, Whom you shall seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, again, this is where the word Ha'adon, it only refers to God. It's used, uh, I think, six times in the, in the Old Testament. But it's saying, a messenger is preparing the way before me. But God is speaking. And we see in Isaiah 40, again, it says there's going to be someone in the wilderness preparing the way for God. So why was Jesus then using this precept? Because people before knew that there will be something divine about the Messiah. And this is why when Jesus says, I showed everything from Scripture, these are the things because this is how God hides his message within his scripture because God is clearly saying to the people I'm coming to earth and again we see in Bethlehem the prophecy it says but thou Bethlehem Ephrata where Jesus was born though thou shall be among little amongst the thousands of Judah yet out of ye shall come forth unto me that is to be a ruler in Israel that's the Messiah and it says whose going forth have been from old from everlasting and if we look at the Hebrew word Olam we see it says the vanishing point generally from out of mind practically eternity so they're saying in this prophecy that the ruler coming from israel is coming from eternity and we link that with the other precepts micah 5 2 malachi 3 1 isaiah 40 they're all saying god is coming very clear and this is why in john it says john bear witness of him and cried why was john crying because he said this was he whom i spoke that he came after me is prepared before me for he was before me but John was older than Jesus so how can he say Jesus came before him if he knew he was older than Jesus he's clearly telling you this is the pre-existing one and this is why for example in John 20 28 Thomas said to him my Lord and my God now some people try and say ah oh, maybe he was saying it like oh my God in shock this is not true because when we go to Psalms in the Septuagint we see the same Greek terminology used. Ho chorios moi kai ho theos moi. And in the Psalms it says, Awake, O Lord, my and attend to my judgment, event to my cause, my God and my Lord. And we see in the Hebrew Bible, the phrase my God occurs 135 times. And when spoken by a Jew, it always refers to Jehovah or Yahweh. So clearly, if anyone wants to say that this is a term of shock, you've got to bring the evidence because we use scripture to interpret scripture never has anyone used this terminology here he's clearly calling Jesus God and that's why Saint Augustine said if you don't believe what you like in the Gospels and reject what you don't like it's not the Gospels you believe but yourself and that's why we accept every line of the scripture that's why when we talk to Muslims they'll say yeah they accept this bit but when we bring them other verses they say oh we don't accept it that's not how you ex understand the scripture Do you we, ask, are you Christian or are you Jewish? I'm Christian so you know a lot about Judaism as well yeah, you've got to learn the, the sources. Mm. So then, again, we see how the, the, the Bible works. Because if we go to the book of Psalms written by David, it says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like, like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones and they stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments amongst them and for my clothing. When we go into the book of Matthew, Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. That is my God, my God, why have I forsaken you? Forsaken me. But we see the beginning of that verse where it talks about being pierced in the hands. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when Jesus spoke this psalm, he did it in order to draw attraction to it and the fact that he was the one fulfilling it on the cross because we see in the Old Testament something was within the text that Jesus fulfilled and again we go into this is a Jewish encyclopedia because they say this is something called the memra because we ask why did John use the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and they say the memra is accordingly the manifestation of God 
the memory brings Israel near to God and sits on his throne receiving prayers. How could that be possible if uh, Jews were Unitarian? That would be idolatry. And they say, so in the future shall the memory be the comforter. My Shekinah, I shall put amongst you. My memory shall be unto you a redeeming deity and you shall be unto my name a holy people. My memory shall be unto you like a good plowman who takes away the yoke from the shoulder of the oxen. The Bible says Jesus came to take away people's sin. It says the memory will roar to gather the exiled. Like Jesus said, he came for the lost sheep of Israel. And then they say the memory is the witness. It will be like to Israel, like a father, will rejoice over them to do good. And it says in the, re in the memory, the redemption will be found. The holy word which was subject of hymns of Job. <coughs> now, a Christian didn't write this. This is what within Jewish, this is a Jewish encyclopedia. So if Christians invented Jesus being this divine person, how does this get into Jewish text? They're reading this from the Old Testament. And this is why we have that concept precept upon precept. We're going back into the Old Testament. And when you look at the prophecies, they not only tell you who Jesus was, but what he was. Because again, we see in Zechariah 2.8 in the Old Testament, it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after his glory has sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he, he who touches the, you touches the apple of his eye. And he says, Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that, I, that the Lord of hosts has sent me. But God is speaking and he's saying he sent himself. That would only work if there was something other than God. And it says, Sing and rejoice. O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst. So God is telling them he's coming to dwell in the midst of the Israelites. And it says, and many nations shall join themselves unto the Lord that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell amongst your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. So if God is speaking, how can we have one Yahweh sending another Yahweh to perform a task? This is where these concepts of a second uh, divine being of Yahweh started to come into early Israelite thinking. What's, I've got to use a bathroom. Cool. No problem. So then we see the Jewish interpretation of this verse and it says this verse is speaking when the, of the hour that the Holy One judges the nations of the world in time to come. The clearly it's talking about God but then God is saying I will dwell amongst your midst and this is why in early Judaism, this portrayal and its rationale was accepted. There was no sense of a violation of monotheism since either figure was indeed Yahweh. There was no second distinct God running the affairs of the cosmos. During the second temple period, Jewish theologians and writers speculated on the identity of the second Yahweh. Guesses range from the div divinized humans from the stories of the Hebrew Bible to exalted angels. These speculations were not considered unorthodox. That acceptance changed when certain Jews, the early Christians, connected Jesus with this orthodox Jewish idea. This explains why these Jews, the first converts of, to following Jesus the Christ, could simultaneously worship the God of Israel and Jesus and yet refuse to acknowledge any other God. Jesus was the incarnate second Yahweh in response, as Siegel's work demonstrates, Judaism pro pronounced the two powers teaching the heresy sometime in the second century. So clearly this binitarianism was accepted. If God was Unitarianism, Unitarian, this would not have been accepted. But clearly when the Christians were professing Jesus was the identity of the second person, they made it a heresy. How is that possible? Because when we look at it historically, it does not favour the Jews. And then this is why Paul said, have this in mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. How could he have equality? Because he was the second divine Yahweh. But emptied himself by taking form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even on a cross. And again, this is why we see in 1 John, it says, by this you will know the spirit of God, every spirit that confessed that Jesus Christ i.e. the word has come in flesh because Christ was the word come in flesh this is what they're talking about and this is why we we'll then get Muslims to say oh but God is not a man but we when we look at that verse it's completely taken out of context because it says God is not a man that he should lie 
nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Yet he said, and he will not do it. Or has he spoken and he will not fulfill it? So God is talking about his character of fulfilling things that when he says something, it will come to pass. But then this clearly goes against the Quran because Allah says, we do not abolish something unless we think of something better. So how is God thinking of something better? Because God is saying he doesn't change his mind. But well, we see in the Quran, 62% uh, of the surahs involve some form of abrogation. How is this possible? And then, because they say God is not a man, but it says in Genesis 3a, and they heard the voice of Jehovah, God, walking in the garden. So we ask, is this voice of God walking? Is it a presence or a metaphor? It says, and the man and his wife hid themselves amongst the presence of God amongst the trees in the garden. So clearly, if people say God's not a man, we clearly see God was walking in the garden. How would this be possible? You know, it goes against all their polemics. But then Allah, in his divine wisdom, said the Messiah, son of Miriam, is no more than a messenger. Have there been messengers before him? His mother was very truthful. Both of them used to eat food. I mean, I heard this, I almost left Christianity. I mean, I, I was going to take my Shahada, you know? Jesus couldn't be God because he ate food. I mean, that is the divine wisdom of Allah. <laughs> but look, I was reading the scripture and then we go back to the verse where the Lord appeared to Abraham. But then it says, when the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and roasted milk and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the tree. So Allah clearly forgot he was eating food with Abraham. <laughs> So therefore Allah has refuted himself <laughs> because this is the biggest blunder in the Quran. Why would Allah try and refute Jesus being God to say Jesus can't be God because he ate food but the Christians and the early Jews believed God ate with Abraham. Clearly this shows you someone who had no understanding of Genesis or the scripture because why would God use that to refute us when we believe God could eat food with people? You know it's like me trying to use a uh, a Shia argument against a Sunni Muslim like you use what the people believe and then try and refute them but if you believe God could eat food with people then you're not going to say Jesus can't be God because he ate food clearly the mind of Allah did not know that he ate food with Abraham and then we see um, before Maimonides the 12th century philosopher before he launched his huge campaign against the idea of anthropomorphism or the embodiment of God the idea that God in some sense in one way or another have a body was much more common in Judaism it is never denied in rabbinical literature that God has some sort of embodiment it is not until the middle ages until Jews are introduced to the Greek philosophy through their Muslim neighbours the Mutaliza and before Muslims get happy the Mutaliza were their philosophers and they were quickly rejected because they're the ones who said the Quran was created as well then we see that the Jews began to think of God as having a body that is present in spe specific space and time problematic. But now we are told all Jews believe this. But in the beginning, this was not so. Because we clearly see in the book of Zechariah, it says, On that day, and this is a future prophecy, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour out on the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look upon me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. That this is the day when Jews realised that Jesus was the rejected Messiah. And this talks about a day when the nation surrounding Israel will attack uh, Jerusalem. Funny, in the Islamic literature, it says the last hour will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews. So we can figure that. So we then go on, how can God be pierced? Because God is talking in this. We then link it to the Psalms where it says they pierced his hands and feet. We see Jesus was pierced. And then another Bible foreshadowing. And if anyone wants to look at this at home, they might need to cross-reference with a few different interlinears. I'm not really a Bible code person, but when I came this, it was very solid in its argument. And I looked at it and I was able to kind of come to the same conclusion. Because we see the line of Adam and his names. And we then look at the meaning of the names. I've always said to people, it's very important to know what names mean. 
and it says man is appointed mortal sorrow but the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest or comfort Excellent. that's the miracle of the Bible because we saw the cross being taken to Shiloh what was Shiloh? Shiloh was the place of religious worship but the prophecy and all Jews agree that that was about the Messiah but now we're seeing the names of the earliest people in the Bible it says that God is coming down and he's going to be his death will bring rest and comfort with now adding up how the bible works god said it's the honor of kings to search out a thing but he conceals conceals it within the bible so now we have to ask sincere people are you a student of history or a student of dogma because i've shown everything from sources not even just from christian sources that's why i went into the talmud i went into the targums because the things not from Christianity, affirming what Christians believe. So we're seeing this historical narrative. Because if you want to follow dogma like most Muslim, fair enough, you can follow any religion if you want to be a Muslim, that's up to you. But if you want to follow what actually happened, then we need to understand what happened in history. Because historicity is the study of historical actuality of persons and events, meaning being part of history, as opposed to being a historical myth or legend, or being part of a recorded history as opposed to prehistory and it seems like a lot of Islam is prehistory name me you know any Muslim that was an Arab called Abraham Ishmael or Hagar before the Quran no one we can't find any evidence and it says questions of historicity arise where accounts of events are be believed by some to be true that cannot be verified either because of a lack of historical records or where historical accounts incorporate folklore as fact issues of historicity particularly apply to the factual nature of events reported in partisan or poetic accounts for example the historicity of the Iliad is a topic of debate because later archaeological finds suggest that the work was based on some true event historicity also arises frequently in veteran religious claims that depend on the truth of historical events and this is why I've taken a historical approach because we're seeing history, history is affirming what the Christians believe when we look at Islam on a historical perspective, we can't find anything. Muhammad saw the Temple of Jerusalem, but it was destroyed. Then we see, so for instance, pure fiction will have few recognisable historical figures and events. Historical fiction may have many, but will contain dialogue and events that go beyond the historical, and the historical narrative will seek to tell it as it was. And this is clearly what we see. In the Bible and that's why I started off saying to understand the Bible we need to understand its literary style that it's showing how God works throughout history and that's why its name is specific things where in the Quran is very vague we don't get an understanding of anything now Allah says desist do not say three it is better for you indeed Allah is but one God and now we look at in the historical perspective this is the article I saw and it says because Muslims like to say Christians stole this from uh, the Trinity from paganism. So he starts off by saying, T.S. Eliot was quoted as once, having once said that Christianity is always adapting itself into something which can be believed. And true to this statement, Christianity has digressed from the concept of the oneness of God, as is stressed in the Shema, or the is Jewish creed of faith in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael Yahweh Elohanu Yahweh Achad. So then it says, O oh, Israel, your Lord is one, into a vague and mysterious doctrine which was formulated during the fourth century. This doctrine continues to be a source of controversy both within, within and out of the Christian religion known as the doctrine of the Trinity. So clearly, I mean, here the Muslims destroyed the Christians because they say neither the word Trinity or the explicit doctrine as such appears in the New Testament nor did Jesus or any of his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Old Testament here Israel the Lord God is one and then he goes on to say now let us study the Trinity and its roots in ancient pagan worship the Trinity of Christendom is defined in the Creed of Nicaea is a merging of three distinct entities into one single entity while remaining three distinct entities we are told to speak of the three gods as one God and never as three gods which would be considered heresy they are considered to be co-eternal, co-substantial, co-equal. 
However, the only the first was self-existent, the others proceeded from the first. This Neoplatonic philosophy doctrine has its roots not in the inspiration of God, but from ancient paganism. But I've started this argument from binitarianism, and we showed you in the Old Testament there was something other than God that sat on his throne and received prayers. So how did then the Christians insert this into the Old Testament? Because I've shown you from sources which I've cited that this verse was very problematic for Jews. They were saying it was the, an angel in the Jewish encyclopedia. But clearly, this was not from any ancient paganism. We're citing our sources. And we're seeing the evolution of how other faiths digress from this. Because what I want to show you is the Islamic explanation for the Trinity. The idea of Trinity, what is this? If you can just shed some light on it, and what is the origin of this idea of tr Trinity? You know, the, the word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. Uh, this word was coined by uh, Christian scholars in the second century onwards uh, to refer to two ideas coming together. One idea is monotheism, one God. Uh, and, and the other idea is that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is also God. Mm -hmm. So now you have three. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of one and three, three in a unity, trinity. The, right, the, right. the word was coined together to reflect that idea. But the word is not mentioned in the Bible because the Bible was not concerned with this teaching. Uh, the Bible co was concerned with teaching that there is only one God. So you will find repeatedly in the Bible, one God, one God, one God. Right, in right. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then Jesus, on whom be peace, repeated the same teaching in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is referred to as the servant of God. But after Jesus left the scene, when he was taken up into heaven, people eventually began to praise him. Uh, and some refer to him as the son of God, because in the Roman environment, if you wanted to say something uh, important about a person, you better start by saying he's the son of God. Otherwise, oh. nobody listens to you because God already had sons by the tons in that Roman environment. P human beings were taken to be gods. Mm -hmm. Caesar was proclaimed to be the son of God. Mm -hmm. So if you had somebody who was more important than Caesar, he had to be son of God. So Christians began to say that Jesus was the son of God in a metaphorical sense, because this was possible within the framework of the Bible. I see. David I see. was called the son of God, Solomon the son of God, Jacob the son of God, mm -hmm. and so on. So it was possible to say Son of God and not go depart from monotheism because you meant Son of God in the sense of a beloved of God, one chosen by right, God right, for a specific right. purpose and so on. Uh, but when the Romans heard this, they thought Son of God, like Caesar is Son of God, literally Son of God. I see, and I see. and when you thought Jesus was literally son of God, then you started to think, well, then he must be like his father. So if his father is God and he is son of God, he must be God too. And now if the two of them are God, but there still has to be one God, how do you put them together and make right, one right, God? Right. So this is how the idea of the Trinity gradually evolved over time. Now, clearly that was garbage. <laughs> because what they do, they make up their own narrative. He would not be able to cite any scholar that agrees with that period, uh, uh, that his opinion. Because clearly he's saying, oh, Jesus called himself son of God and there was loads of sons of God. And then somehow they then got it confused and then associated that with God. But clearly I've shown you, starting from the Old Testament, the earliest beliefs in the duality in God. So when Muslims say, oh, this was from paganism, why don't they ever mention the Old Testament and the earliest Jewish beliefs? Because they want to deceive people. Because clearly, this is not anything that can be found in any credible scholarly literature. His explanation. Because, oh, because Jesus said this and that. That's purely garbage. And I've clearly gone through just why they thought Jesus was God. Because the thing is, what we have to know is that history cannot be changed forgotten, edited or erased, it can only be accepted. This is why it was very simple for me to go back into history, look at sources and build a case. When, when Muslims build up a case, it's through their own invention. So we know objective knowledge is knowledge which is open to public ver verification and is held to be true. In the modern world of empirical knowledge, which can be assessed and verified by the public, the Islamic perception of objectivity and objective knowledge tends to differ. 
However, in that access, experimentation, and whether or not it is verifiable by most people or not, the defining elements of objective knowledge, although they remain relevant, objectivity in the Islamic context is measured by partiality, universality, and justice. Physical, mathematical, and metaphysical truths are objective in nature. Objectivity is also possessed in non-empirical knowledge, such as in the religions, philosophical, and metaphysical knowledge, precisely because a man is endowed with a higher faculties of intellectual discernment, impartiality, and justice. So, this is why for me, when I was looking into this, it was very easy for me to go into the original and earliest sources. But then we see the later sources, for example, rabbinical Judaism, having a discrepancy with the earliest beliefs, because we see how the uh, beliefs evolved. This is why, for example, we know the crucifixion was one of the best attested events of antiquity. But then Jews will say it was, uh, Muslims will say Jesus was not on the cross, but we, they give us no details. Who was on the cross then? Why can we not find any evidence? They just speculate. That is their idea of uh, objective knowledge. Because Allah said so, it's true. And this is why I said, you want to be a student of dogma or history? Because history ain't going to lie to anyone. So, this is why I say in the Quran, 1636 says, and we certainly sent every nation a messenger. So, name me five of the messengers that were sent to the UK. Or name me five that were sent to France. Where's the evidence? We can find nothing, but apparently Christians invented the Trinity, but we're seeing these concepts of a divine being outside of Christian texts, within Judaism's text, and the earliest texts as well. Because why is it then, let's say in the Bible there's 50 prophets, one every other generation. So how come Allah didn't send 50 prophets to every other nation and we cannot find anything? Because in the Hadiths it says there was up to 144,000 prophets sent around but we cannot find any book or any mention of these prophets. Because every time you investigate a historical claim by uh, in Islamic text, you get led to a dead end. So we see one of the main scholarly criticisms is the traditional view of Islam has also been criticised for the lack of supporting evidence consistent with that view such as the lack of archaeological evidence and the discrepancies of with non-muslim literary sources in the 1970s what has been described as a wave of skeptical scholars challenged a great deal of the received wisdom in islamic studies they argue that the islamic historical tradition has been greatly corrupted in transmission they tried to correct or reconstruct the earliest historic history of Islam from other, presumably more reliable sources such as coins, inscriptions and non-Islamic sources. But clearly when scholars look into Islam, they just say it's garbage. <laughs> because we have, I've shown before that Mecca is not even considered as one of the oldest historical cities in Saudi Arabia, but yet this was supposed to have been the station of the Kaaba, which has been from the time of uh, Abraham. There's no evidence of it. Adam did the, um, you forgot to mention Adam did the first Hajj. The first, so yeah. He, so he existed exactly. Years before so if people are always doing uh, Hajj to this place, why is there no historical evidence? So what Muslims like to do, they like to superimpose mischaracterizations on our beliefs to try and refute us. The Trinity is not a mystery. It is a man-made false religion. His name is Tertullian. Truth shall set us free. Nun Amin. The Christianity destroys the monotheism of God, period. Calling God three in one, that is totally unacceptable pagan idea. Just what mathematical formula can prove three equals one? If it is the truth, there is no sense or logic. Jesus, as son of Mary, who is clearly a human creation like anyone else, never said in the Gospels he is God. He has no father like Adam. How come he is now considered as God of Christians? Christians always trying hard to avoid logic and basic understanding. Nothing new here. Same deluded Christians like others. Look how many Muslims were liking that comment. And then we have, this is what it just does to your brain. After the Council of Nicaea was held, many true followers of Jesus were persecuted by the Trinitarian. By the grace of God, some managed to escape. One such group was the seven sleepers of the Ephesus, <laughs> where seven young men took refuge in a cave slept and woke up 300 years later by then they had safe passage out of because non-trinitarian ruler was in power 
their saga was related in the Bible and Quran. I mean, what what kind of nonsense is this? The Trinitarians were were per persecuting the the. Oh, my battery's gonna die. I'm gonna need to go and uh, charge this again. So they all look like this: donkeys, <laughs> certified donkeys. Now we have final boss Mo Hijab, Hijab Mr. Elijah. <laughs> God is with us. <laughs> These are the questions I want the answers to today. Question one. Why is it that in the Old Testament you do not find the Trinity mentioned or inferred? And if it was inferred, why haven't the rabbis, the Jewish scholars, for 4,000 years of Hebrew history inferred it? That's question one. Question two. How is it the case that if the Trinity is explicit in the New Testament, that for 300 years of church history, Nicene Trinitarianism was not inferred by the church fathers. So, we clearly see this guy made some stupid, er erroneous comments. But we'll see what he said. So he said, for 4,000 years, how come any Jewish scholar has not mentioned anything? So, we go to Benjamin Summer. <laughs> Look at his qualifications. BA Summa Cum Laude with distinction in philosophy. A PhD with distinction. So I think he's pretty qualified to be classified as a scholar. And what does he say? He says, some Jews regard Christianity's claim to be a monotheistic religion with grave suspicion. Both because of the doctrine of the Trinity and because of Christianity's core belief that God took bodily form. No Jew sensitive to Judaism's own classical sources, however, can find fault with the theological model Christianity employs when it avows a belief in a God who has an earthly body as well as a Holy Spirit and a heavenly manifestation. For that model is, as we see, a perfectly Jewish one. Perfect! Now, let's hear actually what this scholar has to say. So part of what I ended up realizing as I'm writing this book, rather to my surprise because I didn't think the research was going to take me in this direction, was that some of what we Jews consider almost pagan Christian ideas have more of a native home in ancient Israelite or biblical thinking. Much to my surprise and somewhat to my worry, as I researched this book, I realized that some Jewish critiques of Christianity are actually problematic from a Jewish point of view. So for the exam for example, I think a lot of Jews sort of think that the idea that God could have a son in human form who is God's son but also is God at the same time, that's somehow just a pagan idea. Similarly, the idea of the Trinity, that God is three but one, that's, that's uh, the, the standard Jewish thinking on that tends to be that that's a pagan idea that was taken from the Hellenistic world and sort of smushed onto the Hebrew Bible. What I realized as I was researching this book was that that's really not the case. That the idea of an avatar of a human um, or some other earthly manifestation of the one heavenly God, it actually does exist in ancient Israelite monotheism. And therefore, the idea of Jesus, the theological model behind the Incarnation, is not completely alien to Judaism. Similarly, the idea of the Trinity. Jews tend to think, well, the Trinity means that Christians actually are polytheists. They're kidding themselves. They're not really monotheists, because real monotheism wouldn't have such an idea. But I think in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East, the idea that a single deity could manifest himself or herself multiply was actually without losing the unity of his or her personhood that was actually a standard idea it existed among babylonian pagans but it also existed among israelite monotheists um, and thus the model of the trinity is not in itself necessarily a an, a non-monotheistic or a non-israelite a non uh, a non-biblical idea, but when I use the word Bible, for me Bible means just what, Jews, what Christians call the Old Testament. 
Um, it's not for us Jews really a non-biblical idea. So, all we have to say on that one is because clearly, what did he say? It is clearly a model consistent with early Judaism. And this is why I started this presentation, building up how we got to this position. So, he said how uh, that no uh, person for 300 years as well, three, 300 years. So he said, yeah, for 4,000 4, 4, years. <laughs> no, I've just given you one. <laughs> this guy makes him look like a donkey. Now, he said, how come no one has inferred the Trinity? How come the Old Testament doesn't infer the Trinity? Well, let's see what it says in Isaiah. Come near me, come near to me. Listen, from, listen to this. From the beginning, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it took place, I was there. And now the Lord Jehovah, God and his spirit has sent me. But God is speaking. So how is it we have God speaking, saying God sent him and the Holy Spirit. That is the Trinity right there. Perfect. Then he said the Holy Spirit was not co-equal for 300 years. <laughs> well, he said, how come no church father ever mentioned it? I think Paul's quite credible. So we go to Acts 28, 25, 26, and he says, and disagreeing amongst themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, go to this people and say, you will, you will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive. So let's go back into the Old Testament and see what it says. It says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and said, say to these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. So clearly Paul is equating this verse, where it says the voice of Yahweh, as God. So how is that for co-equality? Because God is... Paul is equating this verse of God speaking with the Holy Spirit. So he's saying it wasn't God, it was the Holy Spirit. So how is that for co-equality? I think we have co-equality right there. Because as well, I'll do this in another presentation, but the Holy Spirit cannot be a mere emanation because he contains all the characteristics of a personality, which includes intellect, emotion and will. And we also see where they say to um, Ananias, you know, you have not lied to, to me, but you have lied to God. So clearly the Holy Spirit was early, from the earliest times, identified with, the, with God. The Holy Spirit was always identified with God. So clearly we see these false arguments are getting debunked very, very quickly. So he wants more Jewish scholars. So we'll go to Philo of Alexandra who reports a Jewish tradition affirming these three are God. Now, his perception of the Trinity was slightly different. It'd probably be closer to what we say is um, like Jehovah's Witness or Ar Arianism. But why did he understand this? We'll see what he says. It says, it is reasonable for one to be three and for three to be one. For they were one by higher principle. In the place of one, he makes the appearance of a triad he cannot be seen in his oneness without something else. The chief powers that exist immediately with him, the creative, which is called Elohim, and the kingly, which is called Lord, he begins to see the sovereign, holy, and divine vision in such a way that a single appearance appears as a triad, and the triad as a unity. So how come this concept is from the first century predating Christianity? Because they always understood there was a plurality in God. But Muhammad's hijab said, name me one scholar. 4,000 years! <laughs> Let's continue. So we see if the uh, Trinity, as with what uh, Benjamin Summer said, that is a perfectly Jewish concept. So we go to the Zohar. The Zohar is widely considered the most important work of Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. It is a mystical commentary on the Torah written in medieval Aramaic and medieval Hebrew. It contains a mystical discussion of the nature of God. The origin of the and the structure of the universe 
the nature of souls and so forth and we see they say the Kabbalah and its teachings no less than the law are an integral part of the Torah Jewish historiography holds that during the time of Roman persecution Rabbi Simeon hid in a cave for 13 years studying the Torah with his son Eliza so basically they lived around the second century or so now let's see what they say in the Zohar Hear O Israel Adonai Elehanu Adonai is one these three are one what? <laughs> These three are one. But how can they say, because apparently God is Unitarian and he's one. But how come the Kabbalists are saying three are one? How can the three names be one? Only through the perception of faith in the vision of the Holy Spirit in the holding of the hidden eye alone. The mystery of the audio voice is similar to this. For though it is one, yet it consists of three elements fire, air and water which have however become one in the mystery of the voice even so it is with the mystery of the threefold divine manifestations designated by Adonai Eloheinu Adonai three modes which yet form one unity so therefore this contradicts that Muslims say Ahad means one it's clearly even the Kabbalahs, Kabbalists are saying there's a plurality within the Godhead now again we see this is what Muslims say 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3 but then again in the Zohar it says come and see the mystery of the word of Jehovah there are three steps each existing by itself nevertheless they are one and so united that one cannot be separated from the other the ancient holy one is revealed with three heads which are united into one and that head is three exalted the ancient one is described as being three because the other lights emanating from him are included in the three but how can three names be one? Are they really one because we call them one? How can three be one? Can only be known through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. In Jewish thought, there is this sort of understanding of a threeness in God. Where are they getting these concepts from? Because surely it's not from the Christians. But this is why I said to you, when we look at things historically, history cannot be changed. And we see within other texts, they are affirming what the Christians believe. Yes, the Kabbalists don't believe in the Trinity in the same way, but we're clearly establishing that other people, aside from the Christians, believe in the threeness in God. And it's clearly not taken from paganism, because the out, go, out of the window goes this idea that it was taken from Roman paganism, because we're clearly seeing Jewish people are admitting within their text there's a threeness of God. So how did the Christians invent the Trinity? How did Paul then invent the Trinity? Doesn't make sense. So, again, they say the Ancient of Days had three heads. He reveals himself in three archetypes, all three forming but one. He, thus he is thus symbolized by the number three. They are revealed in one another. First secret hidden wisdom, wisdom above that holy ancient one. And above him, the knowable one. No one knows what he contains. He is above all conception. He is therefore called for man non-existent. And then we go to the Jewish Encyclopedia. And they say this and other similar doctrines found in the Zohar are now known to be much older than Christianity. But the Christian scholars who were led by the similarity of these teachings to certain Christian dogmas deemed it their duty to propagate the Zohar. So there's, again, the Kabbalah is supposed to go back to Moses. So how are we having in the Jewish encyclopedia that they're saying the Christians borrowed this concept from the Kabbalists? The all the oral Torah, you know, the mystical side of the Torah. So therefore, why is it when we saw Shabir Ali talking, he said, oh, the Christians, they just heard Jesus say son of God and they had tri-unity and trinity and this, that, that. But even from within Jewish texts, they're saying, hey, actually, hold on. There is a triune nature and this is where the Christians got it from. So how can then Muslims say, we got this from paganism because they're clearly lying to Muslims and not giving them this information. How was it I was able to find this out? But when they talk about the Trinity, they ne no Muslim apologist ever mentions this. How is it? They're clearly deceiving the people. And then even when we go into rabbinical texts, it says, we look at Psalms 82.1, it says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So when we go, into the Talmud and it says how do you know that if 
three are sitting as a court of judges, the divine presence is with them. For it is said in the midst of Elohim, he judges. So this clearly shows that the rabbis understood Elohim as indicating three authorities. Hence their courts consisted of three judges. So we now have this understanding when we say Elohim is a plurality, we can see even from their explanation of this, they use the word Elohim to replace three. So, then we go to Genesis 1.26 and then Elohim said, who's Elohim? The three, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So clearly, what we Christians have been trying to ram home to you people is yes, there's always been a plurality in Elohim. And we've kind of seen this all over interweaving interwoven within Jew, classical, classical Jewish texts. So, this guy, for 4,000 <laughs> years, <laughs> he has gone from looking like this, to looking like this, because clearly, he should never go on the podium again. Because both his claims have just been refuted. Now, let's talk about the complexity of God's simplicity. And I want to go into quantum physics because Richard Feynman he said if you think you understand the quantum mechanics you do not understand quantum mechanics then clearly people will say okay the Trinity is hard to comprehend but then we can replace it and say if you think you understand the true nature of God then you don't understand the true nature of God because God exists on a plane beyond our comprehension so when we say he's a triune being this is what he's revealed to us and we don't know how because we've never seen anything like God, but we know it's true, but we cannot necessarily say exactly how he did this thing, but we know, for example, like with quantum physics, it's possible, but if someone says they understand quantum physics, they're probably lying. And Eugene Wigner also said, a Nobel Prize winner said, of materialism, at least in regard to the human mind, is not logically consistent with present quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is something that we observe and scientists observe, but yet they're admitting they do not fully understand it. So what, how much more should we as Christians understand the true nature of God who lives outside a plane that we don't understand? So therefore, if God, the nature of God is not logically consistent with materialism that God is one and we're saying there's a plurality in it, that's fine because even the science around us and observable things cannot even understand quantum mechanics. So therefore, they, when they say it's not logical, they're only just deceiving themselves because they're going on like they understand everything. Because if I brought a quantum mechanics book w with me, they wouldn't be able to explain it to me. So therefore, we know God lives on a plane outside of time and space. His being is different from anything we know. And then, because this is the great thing when I spoke about understanding the Bible, and this is one of my favorite verses because it sum up, sums up the Bible perfectly in God's, the way God works. Because it says, for the word of the cross is a folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will thought. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? So God is clearly saying the way he operates is the way he operates, not how you think he should operate. For since the wisdom of God, for in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. But consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standard. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even these things that are not to bring nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God so clearly this is the narrative throughout the whole bible God's saying I don't care what you think if you mock you you know you're going to miss out this is why we see for example the story of Noah and the ark Noah was building an ark in the sunshine and people were mocking him saying what 
what are you building this ark for? And what happened? The ark, the, the floods came and washed away everyone. We even see King David. He was the youngest of his brothers. And what was he, the greatest king in Israel? When they put him up against Goliath, were they not mocking him saying, you bring this little boy against our champion? But what happened? He defeated Goliath. Moses was obviously, uh, you know, a lowly Jew. A stammerer, exactly. Yeah, a stammerer. But what? He came with the miracles and signs and the Jews believed in his, uh, the Egyptians then believed that his God was the true God. And then also we see many, many other stories showing this, this is how God works. So when people are laughing at the, fo the cross and saying it's a folly or how can God be killed? God don't really care about what you think. He's clearly established this narrative throughout the whole Old Testament, you know. So clearly we take pride in that. So, you know, God doesn't uh, care about the wisdom of the wise or what everyone says. He's clearly shown this throughout the whole Bible narrative. This is how he does things. Because even Israel themselves, they were the slaves of the Egyptians, right? And they became a great nation. So God is shown that he does things by his power and supremacy. So no one can attribute anything else. And we know facts don't lie and people do. So this is why we have the question to ask the Muslims. Why is it Muslims start with a conclusion and try to rewrite history with their speculative opinion despite not being able to provide any factual data while Christianity is consistent with history? Because I've shown you from different sources they allude to what we're talking about. But we've seen they just diverge from what we originally believe. Two, how is it possible that the Trinity mod model, if taken from the pagan Romans, predates Christianity with every detail being connected to and consistent with classical Jewish texts? Three, if Christians invented Jesus being God and he was just a prophet, how come Jesus claimed to be the cloud riding son of man, but the classical Jewish texts show that the son of man was divine? Four, if Christians were so intent on corrupting their own scriptures to affirm their beliefs, why spend several hundred years discussing the nature of God? Why didn't the church just add one verse in the Bible where Jesus explicitly said, I am God, worship me, the Father and the Holy Spirit? It would have been over, because if we're so hell-bent on corrupting the scripture, that's all they had to do to save the hassle. Because it doesn't, the Islamic narrative doesn't make sense. It's not consistent. And in five, Psychologists say a liar skips many of the little flourishes that embellish stories told by honest people as these are harder to keep straight later on. He or she then just leaves them out. So a liar will try to be as incomplete as possible on details including time because these are difficult to construct and keep consistent with later renditions of the story. So how is it Allah, Allah's eternal Quran has 6,000 ambiguous verses devoid of historical value or content, whilst Moses was given the Torah 6,000 verses with clearer timelines and with far greater historical value and accuracy. Cool. So, anyone wants to answer those questions? Go right ahead and give us citations because even when we saw Shabir Ali's explanation of the Trinity, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to cite any scholar because it's all made from his mind. And this is what we see when we look at things like the crucifixion. Muslims always talk about, oh, this, that, they theorise. It's not consistent with history. So, we have to say Muslims are the pawns of deception. Because if we look at Sun Tzu, he says, if you know the enemy and know yourself, you will not need to fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. He says, if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So now, if we say the enemy is Satan and yourself is God. So we'll read that again. So the Christians know their enemy and we know God. So we don't fear anything. The Jews, they, don't, they know God partially, but they don't know the enemy. So this is why they've been led astray. For every, and then the Muslims, they don't know God or they don't know the enemy. So every battle they're losing because yes. they don't know like any of the tactics. So this is clearly why for me going into history I could really easily pull out all these texts. And that's the Dharma translation of Sun Tzu, just for those that want to, because there's other Chinese translations, but that's the Dharma one, just to put that reference. And then this is why in Genesis 3 1 we see the oldest trick in the book. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in, of the field that the Lord ha God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? But clearly he's playing on doubts. This is why Muslims main polemic is who wrote the Bible. They're trying to p give people the same doubt and this is the same tactic of Satan. This is why us Christians, we do not fall for this because we know God and we know the enemy. But people that don't know either, they fall for this silly tactic. Oh, who wrote the Bible is corrupted. Bring us the evidence. And this is why, again, we look at Hebrews 2, 14 and 18. We ask ourselves, why did God come down into earth to uh, make a sacrifice for us? And it says, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subjected to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make appropriation for the sins of people for because he himself suffered when he when tempted he's able to help those who are also being tempted the god is shown a gift of love because we have to ask us what's greater love or mercy mercy is only given when you've done something wrong so god does not act upon him therefore allah is the god of mercy but he doesn't love the disbelievers does he no you have to become a believer for allah to love you but god is saying love is unconditional so he is then putting putting himself forward in a place for you to he's extending his hand for you to extend and take it so god is saying i know what you've been through and i can relate to you i loathe myself for my station you know imagine if you're at work and the, your director who no one's ever seen comes down says hey, do you know what take a a break for a little while let me do your work for you you'll think this is the greatest boss in the world you know, you think, oh, but this is, isn't this beneath your station? And God is showing the same thing. He's coming down to creation, lower, lowering himself from his element so that he can relate to us to say, look, when you're going through struggles, I am there for you. I know what it is like to be tempted. This is a God of love. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this is why we look at uh, Franz Julius Delich. He says, God is the God of truth, the love of truth, submission to the force of truth the surrender of traditional views which will not stand the test of truth is a sacred duty and an element of the fear of god now this is why when we look at the history of our beliefs it stands up to the scrutiny of truth but when we look at the historical claims of muslims that things that happened pre-islam where are all these messengers the 144,000? no one ever seen them before no one knows muslims will also say oh you know we are born with a desire to worship one god but then when we look at the earliest cultures they were all pagans they had multiple gods when we look around the world everyone's pagan so how are we born with a, 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 a in, instinct for mon monotheism clearly history doesn't go on muslim side but what we can say is that we are all born with an instinct of love a love whether it's our family to connect to a, a partner or a love to connect with a higher being because this is what God has installed with us, love. That is his core essence. And this is why we see universally, we all find love in some sort of place. And even if it's through paganism, they have a love for God. They don't know who, but it's this instinct that we are actually born from. And that's why we see it around the world. Now, this is why we go to Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. So therefore, if any person wants to know how to be a Christian all you have to do is just recite these first you know take it just you know say these three words to yourself and say Lord Jesus I believe that you are the Messiah and you are uh, the God of Israel Praise and, and, us. Glory to the Lord. and yes, God Lord. will you know invite God into your heart and God will kind of respond to you so um, also I'm going to put a link in the bottom of this page it's from the bible project so anyone who wants to kind of come into christian christianity and understand what it's about they do a really good bible series it's very short brief um videos about the early books of the bible so you can kind of get an understanding of the overview of what the bible is about and also it's good for those who are more into their bible it's 
maybe get a study bible if you want to kind of look into the scriptures as well and pull out things because it's not always easy to read and extrapolate things mm -hmm. without assistance so on that note why is it that in the old testament you do not find the trinity mentioned or inferred and if it was inferred, why haven't the rabbis, the Jewish scholars, for 4,000 years of Hebrew history inferred it? That was legitness. Yeah.